Hi, I'm Dave Roseberry, and I'm executive director at LeaderWorks, and I have the great honor of um, sitting across in this video land from John Yates III, good friend of mine. And uh, John and a team of authors have just completed a book called Reformation Anglicanism. And it's a great book. It's a, a primer for those who are, you know, unsure a little bit about the history and the the value set that guide Anglicanism, but it's deep enough that it's going to satisfy those who have heard it all. Um, their approach is very fresh and, and, and wonderful. What was the intent of writing a book called Reformation Anglicanism? Most people might say, hey, the Reformation's over. What, what, is, what was your um, intent? It's a great question. And so the, the idea for the book actually came as a result of, of a dinner table conversation with a dozen other clergy. I'm, I'm part of a, a covenant group. There are about 12 of us who get together once a year. Um, we're, we're mostly all in seminary together. We were ordained at the same time. We get together for prayer, accountability, and just rest. And right. Uh, about six years ago, seven years ago, over dinner the last night, um, several of the guys raised this question. They said, well, where, are there any resources out there that really kind of articulate in a clear way what it means to be Anglican? And we could all think of, of various resources, but they all had shortcomings. And, and the guys just said, I wish there was something that I could give a well-educated lay person to read. Right. Um, I wish, we, everybody said, I wish I had had something in my first year of seminary that did that for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was on the phone two days later with Ashley Null, and I said, Ashley, uh, what are we gonna do about this? And of course, it, Ashley had a plan right away. Yes. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he said, do you remember the old Episcopal Library series published in the 50s and 60s? Of course, you didn't remember that. No, I was like, of course not. I'm not that old. Um, and, and he said, what, what if we just did a new version of that? And so I naively said, that's a great idea. And so uh, we assembled this team of authors and uh, we put together this first volume. And then there'll be uh, five more volumes to come. A total of six volumes. Now, this this um, this team of authors are, are sort of the luminaries in, in in one way, but you chose them very very specifically. Um, you've got my, uh, Bishop Michael Nazarelli, Michael Jensen, you Ashley Null, and Bishop Ben Kwashi, which is um, that's a disparate group. Um, tell us what binds them all together. Well, what binds us all together is our commitment to this expression of Anglicanism that we call Reformation Anglicanism, but rooted in, in kind of the founding formularies and the movement of the 16th century. Um, and, and at the heart of that is just a simple shared faith in the Lordship of Christ, uh, which is at the root of the Reformation. Um, I think the other thing that, that draws us together is a shared commitment to the communion to the global communion uh, of the Anglican church and a desire to see a growing unity in the communion and a, and a growing sense of clarity as to Anglican identity. Well, John, when you say a commitment to the founding formularies, um, is that a specific library of things or a few things? What, what exactly is that? Yeah, so the, the term formularies is typically used to refer to several of the founding documents for for the Anglican communion. So that would be the, the Book of Common Prayer yeah. and, and the ordinal, the ordination services. Those are now published together in most provinces. Um, and then the Book of Homilies, which uh, some folks don't even know about the homilies, right. but it's yeah. this series of sermons that Cranmer put out very quickly once Edward came to the throne. And they were to be, they were basic doctrine and they were to be preached in every pulpit in the country. Word for word. Word for word. So it was, I mean, it's great to be a preacher back then because your text was prepared for you and sent out to you. Um, this I mean, it's no work. Um, so the homilies are, are just, are this wealth of core doctrine. And then the 39 articles would be the last of the formularies. And um, 
and, and you know, you can, I think you can honestly, you can go through seminary at an Anglican institution or in an Anglican studies track and graduate and have no idea what that word means. Right. Yeah. It's very, it's very true. The, um, um, uh, one of our friends wrote a book on the 39 articles a couple of uh, years ago and he called it buried alive um, <laughs> because he put the, because the, uh, the book of common prayer had the 39 articles, but they were always in the back yeah. of the historical section. So when I think of the formularies, I think of those things that were in fact buried at the back of the book. And I was well out of seminary before I understood the, Im the import of the words of the prayer book as being the guide of our theological expression. Um, but uh, so your, your desire was to put these front and center in the life of the Anglican Church in North America to allow people access to the, the basic doctrines of the um, Reformation Anglican expression, right? That's right. You know, I, a lot of people think of, uh, they think that Anglicans have no sort of core tradition. Yeah. That it's been sort of ad hoc post Henry's divorce. You know, if you have a clerical collar, then you define what Anglicanism is. And we wanted just to remind the global communion, look, we actually have these fabulous, concise, clear documents um, that outline um, the essentials of a Reformation faith. And, um, you know, the, I, I don't think there's any clearer expression of sort of Reformed teaching anywhere in Europe um, that's as good as, say, the 39 Articles. You know, John, one of the things that impressed me about the book is, is how real the characters in it, hmm. the historical characters, became the quotes that you have in your chapter that Ashley has in, in his, and frankly, that um, Bishop Nazarelli has in his, are uh, quotes from these people who lived in the time of the Reformation, but behind the quotes are a sincere, evangelical, heartfelt faith. And I don't know why that was surprising to me, but I could relate to the way they felt about their Lord. It's, it is, it's great. You go back and you read, um, you know, like works by Catherine Parr, who is one of Henry's wives, uh, Thomas Bilney, who's this little known Cambridge reformer who influences so many other of the leading lights. And as they write about their conversions, uh, you suddenly think, oh, this sounds like John Wesley. Oh, this sounds a little bit like Billy Graham or... And, and suddenly you realize, oh, we've got a heritage here. You know, one of the things that you, you talk about in the book, um, and um, I can't remember what chapter it's in, but it was Cramner's vision to introduce a Bible um, mm -hmm. in every, in every uh, chapel, in every church, but also a Book of Common Prayer, mm -hmm. which, as you make the case in the book, is mostly Bible. Uh, would you talk about that? How important it is how, that, that the scriptures are read, um, not just read, you know, visually, but also heard and proclaimed as a way of, of changing the course of a nation or a church? Mm -hmm. It's a great observation. I, um, at, the, at the core of that conviction, so Cran Cranmer believes that scripture is the divinely inspired word of God. And he believes, and that's not just a conviction that it's authoritative or true, it is. But he believes that it has a power inherent in and of itself because it's imbued with the Spirit. Yeah. And so Scripture is powerful uh, to convert, to transform, uh, to reform, um, simply by virtue of being read. Right. Because because the Spirit of God is active in the act of reading. And so this is why for Cranmer and for Cromwell in the 1530s, it was so important to get the Bible in English in every church and chapel in the nation so that people could actually hear the Word of God being spoken to them. John, one more thing. You know, in, in most people's homes, at least in North America, they're going to find five, 10, 15 different Bibles that they have on their shelf. Mm -hmm. 
um, award Bibles, um, ceremonial Bibles. Um, go back in time and tell us the, the emotional impact of having a copy of the Bible available to the common person in the, in the uh, chapel down, down the street. Well, I, I, one of my favorite things um, that's coming out of this time period that's so vivid is that the, the Bibles that were placed in churches, so, so the, basically the law stated you had to have a Bible in the church and it had to be publicly accessible so that any literate person could come in and read it at any time. Uh, and these Bibles were typically uh, affixed to a lectern with a chain <laughs> um, so that you couldn't take it away with you. Wow. And that's a great, for me, that's such a great image of, of the power of scripture. Yeah. And chained to the, the, to the actual <laughs> furniture of the church to keep people from taking it. Oh. I did not know that. Now we put a little stamp on the side of the leaf that right. says, please do not remove. That's right. <laughs> so, and it, I, you know, I was, it, I was speaking in a church as a guest the other day and um, I had left my Bible in the car and I was using PowerPoint. I had all the texts in there, but I wanted to have the Bible in my hand, um, especially if I needed another text. And, um, and I, I turned to one of the folks on staff and I said, um, gosh, I left my Bible in the car, you know, several blocks away downtown. Um, can, can I just, do you have one I can, I can use? Um, and it was astonishing. He couldn't put his hands on a Bible. Oh my, wow. And it took a couple minutes and finally we found a Bible that had been left in the lost and found. Wow. And, and I thought, the contrast is shocking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, the, you know, the reformers literally bled for this, to put the Bible in the hands of the people. They did. Yet, Indeed. In so many of our churches today, even, even you know, self-described evangelical churches, it's hard to find the actual text of Scripture. Yes, yeah. Well, I love the book. I, I love your chapter on the Bible is just, Fabulous. Thank you. Um, what what is the what are the next couple of editions entitled? What, what, what are the working titles? So the the next two that will come out, well, Michael Jensen is uh, about finished with a volume on worship. Yeah. So, um, that'll be a fascinating look at the, the the shape of Anglican worship, worship, the nature of our worshiping life together. And then uh, Archbishop Ben Kwashi is working on uh, again, he's got a draft called The Life of a Pastor. He's writing on Anglican Wonderful. pastoral identity and formation. So those will be the next two to come out. That's awesome, awesome. And we're excited. Well, um, we can, uh, we'll put a, a link to the book um, on our website and, and whoever watches this is gonna be able to uh, go there and, and, uh, and buy one. I recommend it, I got it both in hardback and also on Kindle. Um, and as I mentioned uh, to John earlier before we began, the quotes uh, themselves, uh, the quotes in, in the uh, book are just fabulous uh, throughout the book. They really sort of sum up the, the way Anglicanism um, integrates faith and intellect and scripture in a, in a wonderful, wonderful way. So John Yates the uh, third um, editor of a book and a contributor to a book called Reformation Anglicanism, along with several others, a team of writers, and invite you to pick that up at your bookstore or order it online. Thank so, you. Um, God bless you. Thanks so much. Thank you.